Our Old Testament reading comes from Exodus 16. Hear these words. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam. And Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pot and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather their fill for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, in the evening, you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the clouds. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them at twilight, you shall eat meat. And in the morning, you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, Quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer lifted, of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. Then the Israelites saw it. They said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given us to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had nothing shortage had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning, but they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it as much as each needed but when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is the day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. And all that is left over, put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning. And as Moses commanded them, as Moses had commanded them, and it did not become foul and there were no worms on it. Moses said, eat it for today is a Sabbath of the Lord. Today you will find, not find it in the field. For six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh, which is the Sabbath, there shall be none. 
On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept through your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept through your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is a tenth of an epheth. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Hi everyone, welcome. For our sermon for today, this story lands us shortly after the Israelites have crossed the parted sea and their oppressor, Pharaoh, and his great army has been wiped out. And these Israelites, they're only a month and a half into this wilderness journey and already they are very bitter and self-loathing. They wish they were dead. They insist that Moses merely brought them out of Egypt to kill them with hunger. They say, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Well, if that was the truth, that would be the most roundabout, lengthy way of murdering an entire population of people that I have ever seen. First, you deliver them from their oppressor, who lets them go only after 10 plagues on Egypt, then lead them out into the wilderness take the long way because they don't face the Philistines who will kill them first, guard them with a pillar of fire and cloud, and right when their oppressor is on their tail, part a giant body of water, escape across it, and drown their oppressor. Sure, Israelites, Moses' murder plot makes a lot of sense. If anything, this is the most accurate depiction of being hangry, that's hungry and angry, that I have ever seen. Being hungry makes you extremely irritable, irrational, and dramatic. Remus Lupin in Harry Potter says, eat, you'll feel better, and it's one of life's truths. Now, you may read this text and be a bit incredulous at these Israelites for their lack of gratitude. How could they treat Moses with such disdain and disrespect. If you reread those chapters in Exodus, when Moses is bargaining with Pharaoh again and again, visiting the hard-hearted leader with a message from God and a new plague to warn him about, you see how much work Moses put into freeing those Israelites. How Moses had to overcome his own anxiety, his own speech impediment, his own self-doubt to be the leader that God needed him to be. And now they are finally free, having jumped through so many hurdles and faced impossible odds. And Moses realizes that the work is just beginning. He is the leader in charge of the physical, emotional, spiritual well-being of these people. 
He is their pastor. Suddenly now he's their caterer, their events coordinator, and their disciplinarian. And he is scared of what's ahead too, just relying on God's instructions day by day, flying by the seat of his robe. And it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in the Israelites' attitude when God actually provides food for them in the form of quails and a fine flaky substance called manna. And they aren't able to follow Moses' rules regarding this flaky stuff. They collect too much of it, and it rots by morning. And Moses gets pretty irritated. Not only do they not trust in God, who has demonstrated divine power beyond all measure with all of these physical signs, but they don't even trust Moses, a living, breathing leader right in front of them. Then they are instructed to collect double portions of manna on the sixth day. Because on the seventh day, God rests because humans are exhausting and the rest is holy. And even with those instructions, some Israelites wander out on the seventh day looking for food. Again, they seem to have trouble listening and trusting their leader and their God. Okay. You may be wondering at this point how the Israelites could be acting this way. This text does not paint them in the prettiest picture, but we do have to remember context. The Israelites have just been liberated from slavery. Their entire identity up to this moment was formed by Pharaoh's treatment of them. Up to this point, they have been living in a cruel system that demanded productivity at all costs, that took away their humanity, that paid no respect to their dignity and worth as human beings, and that system had traumatized them. And then to be yanked out of this harsh world that was your new normal, to start caravanning into the middle of nowhere with your oppressor chasing you down, to walk through a body of water, not sure if you're going to make it through to the other side, and now you're in the wilderness and you have run out of food. These people have been through hell and back, and they reached the end of their rope a long time ago. Now they have to figure out their purpose as a people. Now they have to learn what it means to be worthy, no matter your productivity. Now they had to trust in a God they did not see, and now they don't have the comfort of their home, but instead were out with the elements. These Israelites were dealing with some serious trauma and change, and it left them feeling quite vulnerable. When humans are yanked out of their normal, out of their comfort zones, it takes a while for our perspectives to adjust. Now, I don't think that we can truly compare ourselves to these Israelites and their experiences. But you may find yourself relating to them in other ways. In fact, you have, may have read this text today and said, geez, Louise, that sounds like me. We are in a wilderness ourselves. And God may be providing for us, but we may be too emotionally exhausted to see it. That's because we have been stripped of our normal for some time now. In this wilderness year of 2020, any small or big piece of bad news is enough to tip the scale between faith and doubt, usually sending us careening into doubt, wondering where God is. And before you beat yourself up for it and criticize yourself for not having a stronger faith, stop. Look around you. I don't know your personal faith story, 
But most of us did not learn how to have faith and find God in a pandemic. Most of us learned and practiced our faith with other people in a beautiful building without worrying about a contagious, asymptomatic virus that could kill our loved ones. We are not pandemic pros, okay? We are without several layers of normal. Many of us are without the luxury of leaving our homes to see friends, to go into the office, to take our kids to school. We miss the simplest distractions and comforts, like meeting a friend for coffee without wearing a mask, being able to meet our coworkers in person, or being able to go to the gym and not be afraid of the stranger's breath next to us. We're stripped of our chance to see loved ones who are in care facilities, to take them to run errands and to their doctor's appointments, to hug them without a second thought. Many of us are stripped of our blindness to systemic racial injustice for the first time. And it's hard to navigate our own prejudice and stay in that conversation. Meanwhile, our brothers and sisters of color are asking the white majority to please, please not lose our passion for justice. Please don't give up. And many of us are facing substantial, nearly impossible challenges. Perhaps we're trying to take care of three kids who are in online school at home while trying to work our full-time job. Maybe we got let go of our job and those unemployment checks are running out. Maybe we have lost several loved ones in a short period of time and we are not sure if we can handle any more bad news. Perhaps a natural disaster has struck those you love and you feel helpless. Maybe physical signs of stress are manifesting more than they usually do in your body. Perhaps a loved one has a diagnosis and you are just praying, not now God, not this year. Perhaps you have debilitating anxiety or depression for the first time in your life. Look around you. The world is very different than it was six months ago. We are in a wilderness. And when the Israelites arrived in the wilderness, they had to relearn their faith because everything had changed for them. They went through a very cranky period of adjustment, of longing for the days that they were oppressed just because it was familiar. They had to relearn what God's provision looks like. They saw this flaky substance on the ground and they just said, man, huh? And they probably made Moses pretty frustrated, but it took them a while to figure out that the old normal they were longing for was not at all who God wanted them to be. And when the Israelites were thrust into this situation, a wilderness for 40 years, God had a plan. Every step of the way with Moses, God had a plan. And the theology of God's plan is not something I like to talk about very often because it's usually used to explain away human suffering and tragedy. But in the steps towards liberating those Israelites, God had a plan. God knew Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. God knew that sadly Pharaoh would only loosen his grip on those slaves when God made it personal and sacrificed Pharaoh's firstborn son and God knew that Pharaoh would change his mind and come chasing after them. And God knew what to do when they were in a barren desert land without food. God knew that these people needed to practice trusting God each morning by only gathering what they need for that day. And God knew that these people 
were stripped of all sense of normal. And they needed rituals, structure, to keep themselves sane and rebuild their identity. They needed six days of work and one day of rest. And most importantly, God knew they needed to be reminded of their true identity. God knew that they needed a day of Sabbath each week to remind them that they were not oppressed by Pharaoh any longer, that they were made in God's image, worthy of rest from their labors, that their value as human beings had nothing to do with the amount of bricks they could make or the amount of time they can go without resting. And that is a truth that the wilderness could not take away from them. In this wilderness period that we are in, in 2020, God is still providing for us. It probably looks different than the provisions that we are used to. It may be smaller blessings, little victories, tiny details about our day, things we took for granted before and never noticed. It may not be what we expected or asked for. It's manna when we are expecting a feast, but we are still sustained by it. What is required of us is being willing to look and open our eyes to it. To adjust our perspective. To be willing to be changed. To allow this wilderness journey, no matter how much we detest it, allow it to transform us. Because like the Israelites, we have a choice each day. We can complain and wish for our old normal, not really understanding how or what God is providing for us. Or we can look and see what God has provided for us and look ahead to the promised land. The Israelites did not know what that land would look like, and neither do we. We don't know what is on the other side of this virus, this election, this year. But we know that God is always leading us forward into the next thing. Maybe we'll get back to normal, whatever that entails. But what if God has something even better in store for us? What if this is a period where we are meant to forget how we normally do things so we can learn a new way of living? Maybe God is giving us this time to escape those longings of what once was and enter into this wilderness toward a new land. God does provide along the way. Just like our story shows us, it might seem like you can barely see the next step. Like manna might fall and you don't even know what it is. But trust that if God brought you out, God will bring you in. Remember, we have each other. We have our small, little, tiny provisions, victories, and details. And God will provide what we need. So let's wander together in this wilderness. We don't know how long it will be, but we are together with God, who provides for God's people. Amen.